Kaya, come on, your lama. Thank you very much. What I said in Vietnamese was thank you very much, younger brother Thai. Um, great pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Great honor to be here. Thank you very much, uh, President Oxaby, President Drew Gladney, my old friend from Hawaii. Um, there's a lot that's been going on in relations between, usually when I do this, I, it's a little closer. I can kind of point with a finger, and I don't have a laser thing tonight. That big island there, Taiwan, and the huge looming mainland over there. A lot of progress has been made in this tension point. But I'd like to sort of talk about that a little bit and then open it up to your questions about this subject. Um, one of the things I want to say, sort of a disclaimer as I begin, is that uh, I have no doubt that what I'm going to say reflects U.S. policy on Taiwan. But I didn't bother to submit it to my colleagues in the State Department and the White House for clearance because we'd still be waiting here for that. So um, you should take this as my personal views on the subject. That liberates me to say a lot more. Um, for 60 years, Taiwan, along with Korea, have really been the two flashpoints, the two serious uh, places in Asia where real trouble, where war could break out. And Taiwan is really, in some ways, more serious. Taiwan's the one place where, if everything goes wrong, the U.S. and China can go to war. I should add, I, I live in Honolulu. I don't spend a lot of time there, but I do, in theory, live there. And uh, right down the road, 10 miles away, is the Pacific Command. One of the jobs, the Pacific Command, one of the main jobs, is to prepare for that possible war. So I'm very acutely aware of that. Um, in the last 20 months, we've had a very bright picture across that narrow strait of less than 100 miles. Since the inauguration of a new Taiwan president, on uh, May 20th, uh, 2008, the level of tension across that strait has really significantly relaxed. There have been 12 agreements between the two sides, which have established direct air and sea travel, direct mail service, all of those for the first time in 60 years. And this is probably, I would say this is probably the biggest good news story in the world in the last two years. Um, actually, I noticed Tom Friedman said the same thing the other day, so it must be right. But I would have said it if I hadn't read that. I mean, I think it really, it really is a remarkable, positive event in the world in the last couple of years. And of course, positive events don't get a lot of news coverage, but we should, we should pay attention to it. And I think that if that progress continues, I really do think it could lay the foundation for long-term peace and stability in this area of the world, which was, has for so long been a real hot spot. But, of course, in the last couple of weeks, the news about Taiwan has been about the U.S. government's notification to our Congress on January 29th that we would sell to Taiwan $6.4 billion in defensive weapons. And, of course, the Chinese government has strongly protested, as it always does when we sell anything to Taiwan, any weapons to Taiwan. As I once publicly said, if we sold air, gu air, gu air guns, they would protest, so we might as well sell real weapons. So, um, uh, Beijing canceled ship visits, it canceled meetings between our two militaries, and even a new twist, probably not a smart one considering how American companies are feeling about doing business in China these days, but it threatens sanctions against American companies that sell weapons to Taiwan. Now, China's reaction, all this reaction was not really very surprising. But I think it got a lot of it, particularly got attention because of everything else going on between, Taiwan, between China and the U.S. right now. Think about everything, that's, what's, what, think about the whole list of issues. We've got Google asserting cyber attacks directed from China, quite serious attacks. Frankly, the cyber attacks are the real issue, not the, not, not the censorship. Uh, we have U.S. complaints about China, um, 
China's undervalued currency. That's, I, I would put that at the top of the list. That's the biggest issue. And the unfair trade advantage that gives. We have the incidents of Chinese harassment of U.S. Navy ships. We can talk more about those if you don't know about them. We have the differences over how to deal with the pursuit of nuclear weapons by Iran. And, frankly, as somebody who spends a lot of time in Washington, a general sense in Washington that President Obama's trip to Beijing last November really didn't achieve very much in terms of positive results. Meanwhile, while we have all that going on, in Taiwan, the president of Taiwan, this president who's supposed to be the most friendly president toward Beijing in many years, he said that he absolutely was delighted um, that with the new arms sales that we made to Taiwan. He said they will give Taiwan the confidence that Taiwan needs to pursue the next round of negotiations with Beijing. In fact, I think the whole Taiwan attitude and the attitude of this very positively inclined government toward Beijing was expressed by President Ma toward the Wall Street Journal last, uh, in December. Quote, the relaxed tensions across the Taiwan Strait depend very much on the continued supply of arms from the U.S. Certainly, to Taiwan would not feel comfortable to go to a negotiating table without sufficient defense buildup in order to protect the safety of the island." End quote. So what's going on here? What's happening? We have relations warming between the two sides. Wonderful progress. At the same time, we have Taiwan buying new weapons from America and saying it desperately needs them. And at the same time that that's going on, we have Beijing, and here, here I need that laser pointer, all along the coast there, in Fujian province and Zhejiang province, all along the coast, in military bases, we have Beijing continuing to install missiles pointed at Taiwan. At the same time, they're negotiating with Taiwan for the first time in 10 years. So, what does all this mean? First, a little bit of background, a brief, brief bit of history as to what, what's going on here. Um, 31 years ago, the United States normalized relations with Beijing, and we broke diplomatic relations with Taiwan, or its official name, the Republic of China. But we continued to maintain close relations with Taiwan. We'll call those unofficial relations, but they kind of look about the same as before. And we made a commitment under the Taiwan Relations Act in 1979, passed by our Congress, because they weren't sure Jimmy Carter was going to make these commitments, so the Congress passed it, and he went along with it. Commitments to provide Taiwan with the means to defend itself. We are now virtually the only country in the world that sells Taiwan defensive equipment. The Taiwan Relations Act also contains a more ambiguous but critically important commitment to defend Taiwan in the event that Beijing uses force to intimidate Taiwan, or actually uses force to try to take it over. Fortunately, we've never had to act on that commitment. Through seven administrations, we have maintained peace in the Taiwan Strait through a policy that we call dual deterrence. Military deterrence of Beijing from using force, political deterrence of Taiwan from taking action that would provoke Taiwan Provoke, excuse me, provoke Beijing by changing the status quo. And this policy has worked. It's maintained peace and stability in Asia, but of course it has also ensured that Taiwan has remained the most sensitive, the most difficult issue in U.S.-Chinese relations. Now, since that time, that was 30 plus years ago, since 1979, there's been some really fundamental changes in the way the world looks in that in that region. Beijing, of course, has meanwhile become a great power. It's become a country that other countries have to take very seriously. But meanwhile, in little Taiwan, the little island there, also it had some very profound changes. Taiwan, I, I first landed in Taiwan in 1970. I lived there from 1976 to 77. It was very poor, very autocratic uh, dictatorship. It was um, 
they were growing mushrooms, and uh, that, that was big progress over rice, you know. Um, but meanwhile, it's become a thriving, demo a thriving democracy, an absolutely wild uh, democracy in which any opinion can be spoken and printed, and which there is, 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 is vigorous competition between political parties, and it's become very, very prosperous, a place with a much, you know, many times higher standard of living than in mainland China. And a place which is a, one of the world's key producers of computer technology. A place which defines the global supply chain. Process which, you know, begins in Taiwan, moves to the States, goes to mainland China, then the products are shipped to Japan or Europe or something. It is a place which is absolutely linked in the, in the global production of high-tech goods. A key place. Meanwhile, you have this strange situation in which you have political tension still existing between Taiwan and mainland China, but you have absolutely, absolutely roaring economic integration going on between them. You have, out of 23 million people in Taiwan, one million live across the strait on the mainland, running factories there. With, with some with their families there, some with, frankly, families on both sides of the strait. So, uh, you know, it's a sort of sociological phenomenon as well as an interesting economic and trade phenomenon. And you have, mostly in the coastal provinces, particularly uh, down in Guangdong, uh, there's a town called Dongguan outside of uh, Guangzhou, a little bit off the map, and over outside of Shanghai there, you've got We've got a town, a town um, or we've got a place, yeah, anyway, a place with, where, where, where the huge concentration of Taiwan business people um, making computer goods for the most part. Taiwan companies have invested well over $100 billion in the mainland. No, nobody knows how much it is. Maybe it's $200 uh, billion. Uh, they continue every year more than 70% of their investment outside of Taiwan is in mainland China. Um, this, all of that has produced enormous prosperity, plus you have the democracy I talked about. And it's given, Taiwan's an interesting place, which frankly in its entire history didn't have a lot to do with mainland China, including being a colony of, of Japan for 50 years during the 20th century, the late 19th century. And in Taiwan you have a very strong sense of pride that has developed in their extraordinary economic and political development. And it's deep, that sense of pride has deepened greatly in recent years. You really have to live there to appreciate it. And it's one of the things, frankly, that most China, um, as part of the fraternity of China, China specialists, I would say most China specialists who don't spend a lot of time living in Taiwan really don't have a sense of that separate identity in China, Taiwan, or Taiwan consciousness, as they talk about. And that pride and that freedom to express openly all sense, all points of view has deepened the sense of identity. And over the past 20, for 20 years, from 1988 to 2008, you had two Taiwan presidents, especially the last one, uh, Chen Shui-bian, um, who left office in May 2008, who actively promoted this sense of separate identity. Um, Chen Shui-bian was the first president in Taiwan from the opposition party which had as its goal, its stated goal, the de jure formal independence of Taiwan. For Beijing, uh, Chen Shui-bian was an absolutely infuriating figure, somebody who seemed to want to poke them in the eye every other day. And he never seemed to stop trying to, trying to push, push them to the limit, just trying to find that limit that would cause them to go to war. But I would suggest that Beijing, during that whole 20-year period, also contributed to the increased tension. Beijing took lots of action to increase the sense of isolation in Taiwan, in the international community. Always finding some way to block or to seek to end or degrade Taiwan's already rather limited membership in international organizations. And steadily, year by year, the number of those missiles aimed at Taiwan was built up. And it continues to build up even after the friendly new president took over in May 2008. 
There are probably about 1,400 missiles aimed at Taiwan today. All right, that's the background. So let's look at the progress I was talking about. What's, what's happened since May 2008? After 10 years of no talks, freeze from, 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 from about 1998 until 2008, negotiations between, negotiations between the two sides resumed very quickly after the inauguration of Mai ing in May of 2008. They agreed that they would first start with the easy issues, the economic issues, the transportation issues, and then eventually get with difficult to difficult political issues. As I mentioned before, there have been 12 agreements, actually remarkable agreements, between two very uh, now very economically prosperous parts of the world which had been cut off from each other for 60 years. There are now, as of now, there are 270 nonstop passenger flights each week between Taiwan and mainland China. Uh, there are flights from like from about 25 cities in the mainland to Taipei in the north there to Kaohsiung, which is the big city you see on the left in the south, big port in the south. There'll probably be other Taiwan cities that will start having flights to the mainland as well. 25 cities in the mainland. Plus, there are weekly cargo flights separate from those, um, those uh, passenger flights. And the planes used to, for a while, they sort of started to have charter flights. Now they're regular listed flights. The charter flights used to have to loop down through Hong Kong, way here, down here, off the map, and then go off to Beijing or Shanghai. Or if they were to Beijing, they'd have to loop through Japanese airspace and go up. You know, it was completely insane, and it was a huge waste of time, money, and jet fuel. And uh, none of that's happening anymore. Now, huge uh, saving of time for people to be able to, 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 to go directly. Taiwan and mainland China air traffic controllers now just talk directly with each other. I mean, you can't imagine what a breakthrough that is unless you follow the, the enmity between these two sides over the last 60 years. Taiwan has opened up to Chinese tourists. There were three, over 600,000 in 2009, Chinese tourists. Uh, it's said that their favorite activity is to hold themselves up in their hotel room and listen to political talk shows on the Taiwan television. <laughs> That's very popular. Um, and I hope they're getting a good education from that. So, so. And uh, there are another 300,000 business and family reunification tourists a year. And about four million went from Taiwan to uh, mainland China. Uh, cargo shipping also directly back and forth now between the two sides. Again, you used to have to loop up through Japan or down through through Hong Kong. Postal service for 60 years. Well, for, for years there was no postal service. Finally, they agreed to something where the mail was sent to Hong Kong first, and then eventually sent in the other direction. Now it just goes directly. Uh, financial service, banking, investment, insurance companies are now able to open up some, not totally, but some operations on the other side. And, for some ways, most, most amazing, law enforcement cooperation, including even extradition of criminals. So, and now they moved on to the next stage. This next stage right now, they've done sort of all the easy stuff, the sort of middle difficulty stuff. What they're doing now is they just, just started last month negotiating a comprehensive trade and investment agreement between the two sides. They call it an economic cooperation framework agreement. And it would lower tariffs, be just like a typical free trade agreement, lower tariffs open up um, to investment from each side. Like all such agreements, each side's worried they're going to lose too much, and so it's probably going to be a little difficult. The, um, now, but after the trade agreement's negotiated, then it seems to me what it, things could get kind of interesting because then you get beyond these economic issues, beyond the issues of, of, of transportation, and you get to the tough stuff, the political, the security issues, which they've always said, we'll, we'll put those off until we're ready. Um, one of the things that's, and, and includes also the issue of Taiwan's representation in international organizations, but what you see now in Taiwan is that, from the perspective of Taiwan in February 2010, those issues look tougher than they did back in May 2008. They're, they're, they're less anxious to wade into those tough issues now 
and, and, and they look further off than they did two years, uh, 20 months ago. Poll figures in Taiwan continue to show very high support for what's happened so far, easing the travel restrictions, making, you know, allowing mail to get back and forth. People are very happy about that, no problem. But there's still a sort of core 40% of the population in Taiwan, people who are loyal to the opposition party, the one of the previous president, the one who I said used to like to poke China in the eye every other day. Um, those people are kind of skeptical of all this chumminess and all this good feeling between the two sides of the strait. And as the talks get into now this trade agreement, this comprehensive trade agreement, the, the opposition people, that 40%, but frankly, their criticism grows louder, and their numbers seem to grow a little bit. And when you hear from them, and I go there and I talk to them, I hear them, what, what, and our office there hears from them, is that they say, well, President Ma is leading us down a path that's going to undermine Taiwan's sovereignty. It's going to undermine our identity and our sense of autonomy. All of this is sort of exacerbated by the fact that um, because of totally domestic issues that I you know, don't have time to get into, President Ma's government has also lost some popularity. So in the local elections that have been taking place now, sort of special elections, by-elections, the opposition has actually been doing uh, relatively well. So the result of all that is that Taiwan is now proceeding very cautiously, indicating it needs stronger domestic support before it can enter talks on sensitive political and security issues. Now the one political issue which is uh, very important to Taiwan, very important to people in Taiwan because of the sense of pride, is international uh, representation. After, you know, in 19, up until 1971, China was represented by the Republic of China, which is the official name of Taiwan, in the United Nations. And then it got kicked out of the United Nations in 1971 and replaced by Beijing. And from then on, Taiwan's ability to be represented in anything has been extremely awkward and extremely difficult. Eventually, after many years, there were these sort of weird formulas found using odd names, which let's just Chinese Taipei or the special customs territory of Taiwan, the Penghu, those, those islands in the middle there, Mazu and Jinmen. That's what Taiwan's called in the World Trade Organization. Um, Chinese Taipei is what it's called in the Olympics, and then also in the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, APEC. So, you know, that, those were sort of compromises that were found so Taiwan wouldn't be so isolated in the world. 23 million people in a quite prosperous and wealthy and important place. Um, who have a lot less representation than some of the most microscopic islands in the Pacific Ocean or the Caribbean. Finally, uh, there was a little bit of a breakthrough in May last year, in which with Beijing's acquiesce, acquiescence, Taiwan, represented by its health minister, was allowed to be an observer in the annual assembly in Geneva of the World Health Organization. This frankly came because there was a lot of, this big flap after the SARS epidemic and the avian flu epidemic, that Taiwan, which had all these problems, was completely cut out of all this international health cooperation because of these ridiculous political problems. Now, Taiwan would hope for more breakthroughs, but frankly, this whole issue of international representation is going to be tough. It's going to be sensitive because it involves Taiwan's identity. And identity is what this is all about. And it's an issue on which Taipei and Beijing simply do not agree yet. Now, okay. That's sort of what's happening. Now, the big issue, the biggest issue that's being put aside for now, frankly, is where is all this leading? Does it lead to unification, to Taiwan becoming part of China, part of the PRC again? Where is it all going? President Ma's line that he's used since he took office in May, to, in May 2008 is that his policy is based on what he calls the three no's. No unification, no independence, and no use of force. What does this mean? It means the status quo. It means keep the status quo for the time being. No unification means he is not going to discuss unification with mainland China while he's in office. And frankly, opinion polls in, China, in Taiwan are quite striking. They show that over 90% of the people of Taiwan 
want to simply continue the status quo. They, they, uh, they, have, they do not want to unify with China. And that percentage has actually increased since Ma ying took office in 2008. Meanwhile, for Beijing, unification with Taiwan is a central credo of the Communist Party of China. Fortunately, since Hu Jintao took office in um, 2002, he's shown greater patience on this subject than his predecessor. The former Chinese leader, Jiang Zemin, used to like to talk about, about um, deadlines. And, you know, we need to unify by a certain date. We need to speed this process up. Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao is a little, is, is, that, that, that talk stopped when Hu Jintao took over seven years ago. The focus since Ma ying Ji has been president in Taiwan for the last year and a half has been on gradual reconciliation with, uh, with China, uh, with, with Taiwan. But um, we can already see some people in the mainland, especially in the military, are a little bit getting impatient. The hardliners are feeling that all this may mean unification's never going to come. And they see most people in Taiwan kind of maybe think, kind of hope that is the case. So what does the U.S. think about all this? What, what does the American do? Um, for the U.S., this era of cross-strait stability is very welcome. We have the security commitment to Taiwan. It's ambiguous, but it's a security commitment. We don't really want to have to act on that. This is very favorable to our interests, all these developments. It means the danger of miscalculation, and therefore the danger of possible conflict, has been reduced. Ten years they weren't talking to each other. That was a dangerous situation. Now, now they're talking to each other, every day. We also welcome the pragmatism of President Ma, particularly compared to some people I don't need to mention. He now thinks about how Taiwan's actions or statements might affect U.S. interests. We're, we're glad someone thinks about that in Taiwan. And we will do anything we can to encourage progress in cross-strait relations. But that doesn't mean we're going to mediate, and frankly, neither side wants us to. The pace, the timing, the issues that the two sides discuss is completely up to Taiwan to decide. We're not going to pressure Taiwan to negotiate on a particular topic, and we're not going to pressure them to refrain from negotiating on a particular topic. For many years, the U.S. policy has been very clear. We take no position on the ultimate outcome of Taiwan's status, but we have one concern, one fundamental U.S. interest. Any issues between these two sides of the Taiwan Strait have to be resolved peacefully and with the assent of the people on both sides of the Strait. I'm going to conclude just saying I've noticed that in the recent months, maybe some of you who follow this stuff have noticed, there have been a few articles in Foreign Affairs and other places by Americans arguing that the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act, which made American commitments to Taiwan, maybe it's time to get rid of it. Maybe U.S. security commitments to Taiwan, sales of weapons are no longer needed. Um, now, I share with some of those people optimism that continued stability, step-by-step -step progress between these two sides, uh, is we have a good chance of continued progress. But it's still a really sensitive part of the world. And the stability that exists there is still pretty fragile. I think I'm optimistic enough to say, to believe that at some point in the future, these two, these two sides who have been at war not only since 1949, but since the 1920s, that these two sides, uh, very possibly, they might get to a stage in this relationship as they slowly build confidence. When, when Beijing will be prepared to reduce its offensive posture toward Taiwan, and that's where it is, and Taiwan will be prepared to reduce its defensive posture vis-a-vis -vis the mainland, and that's what that is. And that'll be a great thing if that happens. And at that point, the U.S. could also, um, that would allow perhaps some adjustment 
and U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. But we're not there yet. And it may be quite a while. And I'm sure the Taiwan government's going to tell us, whoever it might be at that time, they're going to tell us when they think we're at that point. And we're going to listen to their, to their point of view, not some retired admiral in the U.S. who's writing an article in Foreign Affairs magazine. I have a lot more regard for Ma Ying Zhu's opinion than some retired U.S. admiral. And so, meanwhile, we have to continue what we're doing. And I think if to pretend that we've reached that stage where they're ready for an end to U.S. support, to pretend we've reached that stage before we've actually reached it would be a terrible mistake and would really hurt the process of a cross-strait cross -strait reconciliation. Because as going back to that quote of Mayan Jew to the Wall Street Journal, they need that support to have the confidence to negotiate. Or as I put it very bluntly when I was in Taiwan uh, last November, uh, bluntly, maybe even crudely, I said, if we, if we stop military support to Taiwan, I guarantee that cross-strait progress and cross-strait relations will grind to a halt. That's a paradox, which is very, very hard for Beijing to understand or accept. But that's the way we see it, and that's the way Taiwan sees it. And so that's the way it is. Thank you very much. Ah, there, was, there was one of these. There was a There we go. There's Gao Sheng. There's Taipei. Okay, how are you going? How about those islands? Okay, they're, they're in the Penghu's. Were you talking about Wenzhou? Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. Well, as a superb diplomat uh, and a living uh, diplomat, uh, Admiral uh, Ambassador Bert Burkhardt <laughs> <laughs> engaged, uh, not someone, not a retired academic who is writing books and giving lectures, but someone who is actively representing the U.S. government in di diplomacy. Um, I think he can handle questions on his own, uh, so I won't need to stand. I'm sure there are many questions, but I think I will start them out by uh, quoting a poster that was on the wall of a former U.S. ambassador to China, also a retired admiral, who hired me to be dean at the Asia Pacific Center, uh, Admiral Joseph Prier, when he was the PACCOM uh, admiral in charge of the U.S. fleet, uh, and when he was later uh, retired from that position and was promoted or, or, or took on the position of being ambassador to China, uh, a very successful ambassador, I sat in his office and uh, I said, uh, Admiral Prier, because I always called him Admiral, and when he hired me, I asked, what does the poster mean on your wall? And there was the Sixth Fleet in the Straits of Taiwan which he had commanded when it was steamed through 1996. They didn't actually go through. Well, but they, were on the they approached. And the bottom caption on the, on the poster said 10,000 pounds or tons of diplomacy. <laughs> and um, it's that kind of diplomacy that the U.S. has been exercising. And I would like to ask... Mutual deterrence. I would like to ask Ambassador Burkhardt if that, in the face not of a 1996 China, but a 2010 China that sees itself as a China that cannot give an extraordinarily warm reception to our newly elected president, rather frosty reception, uh, a China that can say no, Zhong Guo Kui Shuo Bu. If China will tolerate that kind of diplomacy in the near future. I don't know, it's up to China to decide what it wants to tolerate, but um, it's up to, up to us to decide what we have to do. Can I just leave it at that? <laughs> <laughs> Sir? There's a small population of Catholics, both in the mainland and in Taiwan, and so the negotiations with Rome uh, provide another theater for Testing the waters and Actually, it's a source of tension. Um, among the 23 uh, countries that recognize uh, Taiwan, still recognize Taiwan as the Republic of China, and have 
formal relations with uh, the Republic of China. One of them, the only one in Europe, is the Vatican. And um, the, uh, as you probably know, in, in, and so therefore you have a normal Catholic church in Taiwan, uh, a Roman church. And in the mainland, you have this very odd situation in which you have uh, a, um, a government and party created uh, a Catholic uh, organization which um, does not have a relationship with Rome, formally. But I can tell you from years in China and hours and hours of talking with the Bishop of Shanghai, who was a good friend, Bishop Jin, that, that uh, in fact, in China, they do have contact with Rome. And many of the bishops, and so in China, you have this very complicated situation in which you have um, uh, part of the Catholic Church that is blessed, formally, openly blessed by Rome, but operates under, therefore operates underground, and you have another part which is blessed by the Communist Party and therefore operates above, above ground. But many of the bishops who are in the above ground Communist Party blessed church, the Pope says that he also has anointed them in pectora, uh, in his breast, in, in private. And so, uh, as, till that mess is straightened out, um, I don't see the Catholic Church playing much of a reconciliation role between the two sides. Interestingly, and for the, as, as David Elliott knows, Vietnam is an example of a, of a country which, uh, a communist rule country, which did an infinitely better job of dealing with the Vatican than Beijing did. I mean, I mean, Beijing ought to follow Hanoi's example if they want to figure out how to deal with the Vatican. Yeah. Uh, I asked this out of ignorance of China and Taiwan, but uh, has either China or Taiwan uh, thought seriously about uh, the relation, uh, the equating the relationship between China and Hong Kong, and China and uh, and Taiwan? The answer is, from Beijing's point of view, yes, and from Taiwan's point of view, no. Um, they uh, long ago, uh, Deng Xiaoping suggested one country, two systems, and. Um, that idea, of course, is what happened in, 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 in Hong Kong. And frankly, it has gone over like a lead balloon in Taiwan. Um, the reaction in Taiwan is, we were never a colony like Hong Kong. Uh, we, uh, we exercised real democracy in which we ruled ourselves. Um, Hong Kong never had that experience. And so uh, they are not interested in that model. They're real, really not interested in that model. In fact, in fact, the faster Beijing, it, actually, you've heard, you 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 haven't heard too much about the one country two systems idea in the last couple of years. And the more Beijing moves away from that, the easier it is to to talk intelligently with Taiwan about these these issues. Right. Sir, uh, I think you mentioned something about. Harassment of American uh, yeah. naval vessels in the Straits. Not in the Straits, in, in, in the South China Sea and other places. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't heard about that. Could uh, you describe it somewhat? This is a big issue. Um, uh, Taiwan, uh, I'm sorry, mainland China has a different view of uh, the law of the sea than the United States does. In fact, a different view than most countries do. Um, Mainland China, okay, we'll go back, in the 1982 um, Law of the Sea, uh, each country was given a 200 mile, uh, this is not the greatest map for it, each country was given a 200 mile economic, exclusive economic zone, in which it had control over fishing, fish bed, you know, seabeds, mining, all that kind of stuff. And, um, but, it was very clear, and there was a huge fight over this, and. Beijing took the point of view that that exclusive economic zone should be essentially sovereign sea. And it lost the fight. It, it, it did, simply did not win that battle in the 1982 negotiations over the law of the sea. And it, was, and it was decided that this was not to be considered sovereign sea. Sovereign sea only goes out to, what is it, 12 miles, I think, 
for 12 miles. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, but Beijing has never fully accepted the fact that it lost that battle, that, 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 that dispute in the negotiations over the Law of the Sea. And so, it, can, it, it in, when, when U.S. naval ships patrol uh, uh, outside of the 12-mile limit, but within the 200-mile exclusive economic zone, uh, Beijing has, in the last uh, few years, last, particularly in the last year, or the year or two, there have been a number of incidents in which Chinese ships, sometimes using fishing ships, which aren't really fishing ships, or you know, all, all kinds of techniques are used, uh, to harass the American naval ships, uh, trying to, uh, you know, the, the naval ships sometimes drag these, um, these uh, radar arrays in which they're, you know, they're trying, to, they're, trying to, they're trying to look for Chinese subs, they're trying to look for, for, for other things that Chinese have, you know, planted in the sea. Mm -hmm. And um, as they go along, the Chinese ships have actually physically tried to block the American ships or physically tried to... Uh, capture the arrays that were being dragged by the American ships. There have been some very uh, nasty uh, incidents. Sir. The U.S. has been preoccupied with the Middle East, yeah. Iraq, and Afghanistan. Uh, and what effect has our preoccupation with that part of the world had on the Taiwan PRC relationship? Are there, is there, is there any discernible effect that was Japanese are thinking about forcing the U.S. to leave Okinawa, about bringing the U.S. that will have? <coughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's a good question. I'm not sure I see the relationship quite, quite that directly. So, I mean, I think particularly, particularly during, during the last, the previous decade, there was a widespread feeling in Asia that the U.S. was, was, was distracted over the Middle East and not paying enough attention in, in Asia. In fact, even if you go back to the Bush administration, I think it was more the case in the first Bush administration than in the second Bush administration. I think actually the second Bush administration start, started to sort of realize it needed to pay more attention to Asia. I mean, I'll never forget being with um, a whole group of American ambassadors in Singapore. I think it was in late 2003. And we were meeting with high-ranking officials in the Singapore Foreign Ministry. And in the typical sort of sarcastic and acerbic style of the Singaporean Foreign Ministry, one of them said to us, um, you Americans, you know, whenever a sentence begins with that, you know, the trouble is going to come. So he said, you, you, you Americans um, are spending all your time distracted by working on a part of the world, meaning the Middle East, in which nothing is ever going to turn out right. He said, and you're ignoring the new center of gravity of the world, our part of the world. And of course he was right. <laughs> and and uh, I hope we, and I think, I think the Obama administration actually got that point. And you, you hear that from, I mean, we're still spending too much time spending worrying about a part of the world in which nothing is ever going to turn out right. But, uh, but we, are, we are paying more attention to Asia. Um, Secretary Clinton, the president, others, I think it's, get, it's getting attention it deserved, particularly Southeast Asia, which really was not getting enough attention. So I, I, I think as far as, but I don't, I think that there is a certain, yeah, I think there's been a certain, um, China to a certain extent took advantage of U.S. negligence in paying attention to Asia to, to make, you know, to increase its influence. And who can blame it? Uh, I think there was, that, and I think that's, and that's the issue you hear from people. In fact, when, when President Obama was in Asia in late November, one of the messages that he heard uh, very loud and clear from countries around the periphery of China was, um, we want you to stay here. We need your alliance structure. These are even from countries that were not allies. We need your alliance structure. We need your forward presence to continue. You need to be involved here. We need balance in this part of the world. Uh, we need to have something that balances the rising Chinese influence. And so please, uh, please stay involved. And this was very interesting. A lot of the people in the Obama administration had not 
you know, not spent a lot of time on Asian issues, not spent a lot of time on foreign policy issues. This was quite a revelation, and some, some, something, sorry, something that was they found to be quite, you know, a significant thing they learned on the trip. Yeah. Over here. Um, I know that uh, Trump is the reason why I'm in Taiwan right now, and um, he's quite active and he's like an activist also. Um, The question was about Wang Dan, who was one of the three main leaders of the Tiananmen uh, demonstrations in Beijing. And who are Kashi's there too? Right, and who's now, who's now in now in uh, in Taiwan, and whether Taiwan can become a leading place for the, the sort of diaspora of intellectual or dissident leaders of China. Um, that's. That's not an issue for the U.S. government to have an opinion about. It's sort of just a simply, a, you know, sort of a, an academic. But if anyone is speaking as a sort of a, you know, a student of the issue, I would say um, the, the I'm not sure the atmosphere. I, mean, I would say that the political atmosphere in Taiwan uh, is would be complex for people like that because you've got. The deep blues in Taiwan. They have these two. They have two two political centers: the blues and the greens. And you know, some people even take it to the point of what kind of tie they were. So, and the the blues are the people who are more sympathetic to better relations with mainland China. The greens are the people who are more in favor of Taiwan independence. And these are terms you hear this all the time, every day, all the time. And so the current ruling party are the blues, the previous ruling party were the greens. And um, frankly, the blues have less time for people like Wura Keishi or Wang Dan. To some extent, they're viewed as, uh, they create trouble for the relationship with China. Whereas the greens embrace these people because they, they, they represent everything they see as wrong with China. So um, that atmosphere, I, don't, you know, I suppose it can be a, um, uh, there's space for these people in Taiwan. I mean, no one's going to suppress them or cause them any problems. So. But uh, with all that debate, they, they, they end up being kind of in the middle of a political debate in Taiwan, which is not, not it doesn't, I'm not sure helps their cause that much. So I don't know, they may, I, I would think the U.S. would be a better place for them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, there was a time during the presidency of Chen Shui-bian uh, that I understand the United States was not pleased with his uh, reluctance to uh, accept or pursue the, the purchase of the kinds and quantities of weapons that we wanted Taiwan to have. Uh, it was a little counterintuitive since he was the no, one. No, that's not. That's not right. Really? No. No. Um, the original offer of uh, most of the weapons that we've sold since 2001 and the two big sales, the October announcement of 6.4 billion and the announcement last month of 6.4 billion, not all of that stuff, but most of it was offered to Chen Shui-bian in, uh, in April 2001. I was there at the meeting in which we, we made the offer to him. Um, and he was delighted with it. And the problem was that there was, uh, it, the, the whole arms sale got, got caught up in political struggle within Taiwan. And actually, the, the, the current ruling party, the KMT, which did not want Chen Shui-bian to, to succeed at anything, uh, opposed a lot of the sale of these weapons in the, in the legislature, refused to pass the money, the, the budget, the money in the legislature. They did. They didn't totally block it. They passed it for some kid destroyers and some other things. And eventually, toward the end of the administration, uh, they passed a few more things. 
but the, the, it got completely caught up in domestic politics. But it was not, it was definitely not, I, have, I would have to say that was not the fault of the DPP. So it was not, there was nothing, uh, the inconsistency you think you saw there was not there. Not, not, was not there. No. Yeah. Sir.